Please welcome Captain Patchett. Today, when we get ready, people call and they say, what kind of fishing can we do and when can we do it? You almost have to bring out a, a, a lawyer along with you just to determine when you can fish, what kind of fish you can catch, and what time of the day you can catch the bed. And right now, we, we fish for salmon, we fish for sturgeon when they let us, uh, bottom fishing when they let us. Uh, albacore, halibut, all these different fisheries. And they all have their different seasons and different regulations. And they're, you can fish Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and one day, and, and Friday and Saturday for different species on another day. And, and it may or may not be open when people call us. We have to tell them the phone, well, we might have a season. You might be able to catch salmon, or you might be able to catch sturgeon. We just don't know when. And so it makes it really difficult from a business standpoint to book anything or to sell anything when you don't know if you have anything to sell. And so if, if every year we have something, we just don't know what. You know? So it makes it kind of difficult for us to run a business and tell people what's going on. That's, that's the way it is now. But it wasn't always that way. You know? Clear back, I have to go back to the uh, late 50s when I started decking for my dad. And, you know, it was a different story then because all we ever did was salmon fish. And people phoned up, what are we doing? We're salmon fishing. When can we go? Anytime from mid April to mid October. And our seasons would run that long. And it was, you know, not quite in the 50s, but in the, the charter industry peaked in the 70s. And about the mid-70s, I hauled over 2,000 people on my boat alone, you know. And I made 166 trips in a row wow. without a day off, you know, just straight through. And so it has changed considerably then because now if you can get 80 or 90 trips in a season, you're doing good. And uh, if you're going to haul seven or eight hundred people in the season, you're doing exceptional. And so it has changed considerably from, from the beginning to where it is now. So I just kind of give you that, that kind of overview of our industry. The key to any successful industry is one, you know, because they're always in the background doing all the work. And my wife is here today, and she probably, more, you know, I get all the glory. You know, I, I go out fishing, I greet the people, we take them out, and we show them a good time on the boat, they kiss their fish, and, and we have the adventures of the big wave. Did everybody see the big wave? Yeah. That's the bad. We get the picture of the bad out there, you know, and, and so we have all that adrenaline rush and, and all the excitement of what we're doing. And, and my wife sits in that charter office, and all she gets to do is get up at, you know, 3 30 in the morning and pack the lunches for all her husband and the grandkids and the, her kids and everything. And then goes down and greets people. And then she has to wait all day in the office wondering if we're going to come home or not, you know. Which I know it is her mind every once in a while. And then uh, if if the customers are happy or not, because they're gonna come up and complain that they didn't have a great trip, you know. So she gets to do all that. That's the ugly, not she, but that's the ugly part of the business because she has to do all that. 
And whatever success I've had in my lifetime, sit right over there <laughs> for 50 years. So where do I begin? Oh my goodness. Got to begin with my dad. You know, that's that's where all well I'll take that back. I'm gonna go what's the I'm gonna come back to the future here. Just bought a boat last year. You think I'd know have better sense of 72 or 71, almost 72. And I'm buying a boat and I'll never see, you know, I'll never pay for it. <laughs> I'll never get paid for it in my lifetime. Right? But I did, and it's called the Legacy. And it wasn't after me, it's named after my dad, because he's the one that got it all started. And uh, I didn't know my dad very much. He was a policeman in Portland. And uh, I can remember being in the second grade, they asked me, what does your dad do? And I didn't know, <laughs> because I'd never seen him. He was working like three jobs all the time. And uh, then, he had this, this he bought a, a motor, and he had it in a, a rain barrel. You all know what rain barrels are, you know. <laughs> and he had it in rain barrels, a five and a half horse Johnson, and that motor never left the rain barrel. <laughs> he'd sit there, he'd just start, he'd come over, he'd just fire it up and run it, you know, and just say, oh, it's going to be great. And uh, it never left the rain barrel. And that was the beginning. Of, of all of this, you know? <laughs> and so uh, he ended up getting a uh, going out, and we started chartering. He got a boat, a, a 23 foot Owens, it was called, not a very big boat, and we were chartering out of Astoria, a little place called Pacific Coast Charters. There's a little hole wall by the Thunderbird, or what used to be called the Thunderbird over there, on the docks, and. Uh, we get up in the mornings and I, I got the deck for him. I was 10 years old and I got the deck for him and I thought this was the best years of my life starting because now I get to know my dad. And he was a great guy. Excuse me if I get emotional. Sometimes I do. I love that guy. And we had the best time. You know, it was just one of those things that in a family, get to work with your dad. And I got to know him. And, and we were not only friends, but we were buddies. We did everything together. And we fished together. And if there's, if there's one positive I could say about fishing, it's that relationship has passed on from generation to generation. Excuse me. So, we would get up in the morning, if we had more than five people on that boat, we had to put thermos forks in the scuffers to keep the water from coming back in. <laughs> so, and we'd head out to sea. And when we were over in Astoria fishing, we heard the stories of all the fishermen in El Waco, because El Waco was big time. And we were just kind of a small little guys over there. And they'd be hear the stories about all these guys catching 30 or 40 fish and, and coming in early and, and all this. And, and we used to tell our customers, they said, oh, you know, they tell anything on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'd go out on that little boat, we never went past Bowie 4, ever. You know? we, we fished what was called the pocket in behind the South Jetty and, and fished all day long. Didn't catch a whole lot, but we, we saw, you know, we learned. And, uh, it was then, as a deckhand, that I, I broke the rules because my dad said he wanted the baits always to just slow moving bait in the water, not spin very fast, not do it much, you know, because that's what those big kings liked, you know. And so I, I stuck a bait out one time and it looked like a top of the water. It was just spinning like crazy, like this, you know. And it wasn't out for more than 30 seconds. <laughs> Fish on. And I didn't tell my dad about that until six years later. 
<laughs> you remember how come I was always beaten when I finally got my license? You know, I said, ah! Now, we called it the CBC Twist. I invented that when I was 10 years old, and it's still being used out there <laughs> by almost everybody now. And, uh, but uh, that's, that was kind of the beginning of it all. My dad and I, and, and running out of that story. Um, a lot of things have changed since that beginning, you know. I think of navigation, and, and we had, at the time when I first got my, my license, I was uh, 18. And uh, it's funny, you know, when you're 18 years old, and, and people get on the boat, and we didn't give orientations back then. People get on the boat, we just left and took them out fishing. And uh, I get halfway out, and everybody's kind of looking around. He said, where's the skipper? <laughs> <laughs> said, I got you. <laughs> Can't turn around now. But uh, my first trip out, it was foggy. I had four deaf mutes on the boat. And we bounced our way out the Oahu Channel in the fog. We just kind of go from one side of it to the other because all I had was a compass and a flasher, you know. And uh, we bounced our way out the Oahu Channel and, and worked our way through the fog out in the ocean. And then finally the fog lifted. That was a good thing. And on the way in, oh, did you see the wave? Uh -huh. <laughs> the bat? Where's my picture? I need the picture. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> this is the bat. <laughs> so, when I came in that day, oh, well, you want to get a visual of that before I so you can refer to it often? because I'm going to be referring to it often. Okay, good. Um, that's the man. And on the way in, that first trip out, 18 years old, the man was on the bar that day. <laughs> the man was on the bar. And being 18, you can do anything at 18, so cross, you know, we, we went across that with the band behind us, you know, kind of working our way through. And I looked back, and all I saw were hands doing this, you know. <laughs> Eyes this big, and they were talking up the storm. <laughs> I think they were yelling. <laughs> but I couldn't hear, so it was okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so, fog plays an important part in, in our industry. And anybody who's been out in the ocean in the fog or across the bar in the fog knows how tricky it can be. My dad and I, I was decking. We were on a 33-foot boat. It was the first naughty lady. That's the name of the boat. And uh, we had heard reports that there were big waves out the bar. But Nothing terrible, there's nothing breaking. So we go out and we're probably on the south side of the channel. And it's foggy, you couldn't see a thing. But you could hear. It was like a, a loud thunder. And and my peering through the fog. We saw this wall, and it turned black. I mean, it was just this huge black wall. And we're up in the fly bridge of our boat, and we're looking at an angle like this at the wall. And that was triple bad. <laughs> and my dad and I looked at each other and we said our goodbyes because we thought that was it. And the wave came completely over the boat in that big curl. We went inside the curl like this. 
the curl actually went over the top, and the bolts, you know, shot straight through the weight on the back side, and it was so steep that we fell 20 feet, wow. just straight down. And uh, I guess I wouldn't be telling the story if we, you know, <laughs> turned out differently. But uh, my dad says the anchor came loose, and it was just flopping on the deck. He says, you got to go secure the anchor. I said, really? <laughs> so I, I, I tore it off the bridge, and I, I was securing the anchor. Well, in this picture, you can't see it very well, but behind the bed was more bad, kind of, you know. And uh, I just secured the anchor, and we were just going into the second bad, and I grabbed the the bow rails, that was for stainless steel. My fingerprints are still the stainless steel <laughs> and, and I was completely submerged. You know, all I had contact on was, was my hands on that rail. And, uh, but we made it through the bad. <laughs> so here I am today. Um, Did you have customers? Oh yes. At that time? Yeah, yeah, we had customers. Uh, I think we still have. <laughs> <Stay going>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. I don't know if they ever came back, but we had them that day. <laughs> oh my goodness! So that was my introduction to the Columbia River Bar. You know, I've been over it over ten thousand times in my lifetime, and. and that was one of the most exciting times going across. I've had a few others, but, but that was one of the most. I have my notes for today. <laughs> and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the navigation. I've got some stories about navigating the Book River Bar. Um, one of the first boats I had, right, it was called the Molly Brown. And if anybody's familiar with the story of the Molly Brown, it was, it was referred to as the unsinkable Molly Brown, only it was a different, it was a person instead of a boat. But I thought I named her, but I figured it'd be appropriate. <laughs> and I had quite a few experiences of the Molly Brown going out across the Pope River Park. Um, one day, we were, yeah, as I said, it was foggy, you couldn't see anything, but you could hear. And a couple of days in a row, we were going out and along the North Jetty, and then you get past the North Jetty, you have Peacock Spit on the right, and a lot of bad water on the left as you're going out. And you could hear these waves, you know, just breaking. On both sides, because the jetty, you know, the spit was loud too. And you couldn't see anything. I knew the slot was there, and so you just go out and out and out until you can't hear any breakers on the right side, then you knew you could cut across the spit. But it was all by he hearing, you know, and you couldn't see anything. And uh, I just made that turn. And the engine caught on fire. <laughs> so, I, uh, I'm still here, but it was, uh, that's one of the issues of navigating out there, that, that you learn to do it by, by sound as much as you did by electronics, because we didn't have any electronics, you know, the compass <laughs> and the flasher that was in. Uh, are you just going to leave us there with your engine on fire? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do when your engine's on fire? I, I jumped off the bridge. It's a small boat. It's only a 26-foot boat. You know, I thought it was a Queen Mary, but it's only a 26-foot boat with a flying bridge on it. I jumped off the flying bridge. And I, I landed right on the hatch, and it broke the hatch. <laughs> and so 
I have had easy access to the engine that way. That creates the fastest way to get there. We, we put it out, got the fire out, called the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard came to get us. And again, it was one of those deals where your hearing was more important than anything else because um, they couldn't find us. You know, it was, it was so foggy that, that nobody could find you out there. And I knew I was off the spit. So I, I told the Coast Guard, I said, you know, once you, you cross over and, and make the turn past the jetty, I'll listen. And when I hear your engine lined up with the boat, the, you can see the sun above you. You could, it was foggy, but you can see the sun above. I said, when I line up your, the sound of your motors with my boat to the sun, then come to me. Yeah, I'll tell you the turn and, and come to the sun, aim for it. They did, they found the same way, so wow. you know, that's, that's how it worked. <laughs> but at any rate, so you had to use your, your you know, a lot more than, than what people do now. But now everything's mapped out. I mean, you turn on your GPS, you look at it, you can see top down everything. It makes it so much easier <laughs> than it did when we first started. But anybody who's, who's been in the business and take a boat out knows what I speak, you know, especially if you're, if you're my age and going out there. So that was, that was one of the stories that, that one of my favorite ones was my dad had, had built a, a table in uh, the old Four Seasons, which is a 42-footer now, the bigger boat. And he built a table there, and, and he was going to varnish a map on it. You know, and so we took a chart of the entrance to the Kobe River and, and the ocean. And uh, it didn't turn out very well, so he just flipped the table over, you know, and, and did something with the other side. We're out there in this foggy as could be, another foggy day. And this time we're fishing right out in front, except that on some of the ebb tide. We got pushed out further than I could ever imagine, you know. I, my dipstick there was over 70 fat or 80 fat, and I said, I don't even know where I am. And uh, so it comes time to go in. And I'm thinking, where are we? <laughs> you know, and, and, and if you get on one side of the river or the other, you're, and you don't know which side of the river you're on in the fog, it, it becomes problematic because you don't know whether you're going to go up to Westport or San Francisco. You know, you just, <laughs> so, I, I have to, we're getting ready to pull, I mean, we pulled the gear, we're getting ready to go, and I had no clue, and I remember that chart that was under the table, like this. <laughs> I told the customers, can you please get up the I did for a second? And I crawled out of my back, and I'm looking up under the table, <laughs> trying to figure out where we are. You know? <laughs> and, and so I got kind of an idea. And, and I just plotted a course, a compass course, and I ran three hours. And I never saw a thing for three hours of running. I had no clue at that time where we could possibly be. And after three hours of running, through the fog, I'm looking, there's the tip of the South Jetty. I said, oh my God. So it's good to be lucky. <laughs> you know? But, uh, that's, that's uh, part of the adventure, part of our, our business. I got another fog story. This time, there was no bad. No bad. But it was interesting. I'm, this is what I was begging for my dad. So I'm going back and regressing a little bit. We're fishing off of Long Beach. Thick fog. Couldn't see a thing. I'm up on the fly bridge. My dad is visiting with the customers down below. And they start hearing some voices. I said, oh, there's going to be a boat nearby. I'm listening, and I'm looking, and listening, and looking. And I see three girls right by on horseback, right across the bow of the boat. 
So I thought I'd better take a look at the engine room. And so I opened up the engine room and, and it's two thirds full of water. So I stepped down to the engine room and, and I had that much in water. And the boat's rocking back and forth, so I go from here to here, you know, and I can know where the bird's sinking. I, you know, I couldn't find a leak. But I had no way of getting the water out of the boat because all the pumps were underwater. And I had oil in the bilge. Nobody gets oil in the bilge on a Detroit <laughs> diesel. So at any rate, there's oil in the bilge, the bilge pumps aren't working, they're underwater, the engine's about ready to go underwater, and we're out there 35 miles all by ourselves. And then I'm sitting there trying to find out, you know, and so I went to, uh, on a, on a, uh, luckily it's not a kill pool, you know, it was that uh, we had a, what? Lost my thinking here for a second. But at any rate, we have water that comes in and cools the engine. You know, it pumps in, cools the engine, goes to the heat exchanger, that's why this thing up. And it goes to the heat exchanger and then ends up going out the exhaust, the wet exhaust. And so I thought the only way I could get the water out of the boat was to cut the holes of the intake, because you couldn't get it off, it was too tight. It, it made, it's trying to get a hose, old hose off a boat, you can't do it. And so I, I cut the hose, you know, turned off the valve so it wouldn't add more water coming in, and used the hose at intake while the engine was still running to empty the bilge, you know, to, to empty the water out. And it worked, you know, it, it was one of those amazing things that just sit there and think, okay, Anything under pressure, you know, <laughs> any part of the storm. And so we did that. And then, but all the time, you know, I was sitting there before that, I started to find out where the leak was coming from. I couldn't find it anywhere. And I went to all the compartments and, and no sign of, of water coming in any place. And the Coast Guard escorted us back in. We come in under our own power after we got the water out of it. And the Coast Guard came through, looked at the boat, nobody could find the leak. And I'm down there in the bells and I'm kind of leaning back and it's been an exhausting day. And I'm looking up and we have a hose going to the head that also fed a deck pump and we had a T in it. And that T had come loose. And the boat has a, a, a pump that, that reacts to pressure. So once that T broke loose, it wanted to pump water. And so it, we were pumping water into the boat all the time we were out fishing that day. <laughs> and I was, I was getting ready to get a drift and I noticed that my electrical gauge had gone haywire, that it, it wasn't charging anymore and I thought, I better shut off all the unnecessary electronics just in case. And one of the things I shut off was that head pump. And had I shut that off, we would have sunk. <laughs> and it came that close. So that, that's why my wife doesn't like me. Because <laughs> I put her through all that. <laughs> It's hardly a day I, I go out, and we always go by Cape Disappointment on our way out to uh, where we fish. And I always point out that's where I propose to my wife <laughs> at Cape Disappointment. <laughs> it wasn't disappointing, believe me. Which time am I? 25 minutes. I want to leave some time for people to ask questions. Um, I've got a gazillion stories. Uh, it just happens. One of, my, one of my favorite days of the water 
was a day that, you know, there's always politics going on in the fishing industry. And at one time, not so much anymore, at one time, uh, the, probably the commercial and the sports industries were not the best of friends. So let's put it that way. And I've always been friends because I've taught for 30 some years. And, and when you teach, you, you have to be diplomatic at all times. And so I try to keep an open mind to things. And, but in protest, the commercial fleet shut down the harbor. They put a blockade on the entrance to the, the port of Milwaukee. And it was on a Saturday, very busy Saturday. And I had a group of, uh, that always came late, and this time they were early. And I didn't know what was going on. And so it was dark, and I'm heading out through the channel, or heading out to the basin. I'm getting ready to go. I see these boats starting to pinch the channel, you know. And I looked over my shoulder and I saw a bright light that looked like a gun or rifle or something up there. And I guess it was a TV camera at the time, but I didn't know that. And I said, whoa, I even ducked. You know, I thought, whoa, like this. And I, and I ducked, I put full throttle just like this. And we shot through the barricade before it had closed. Before it and that was the only boat that got out. And this time, No bad. <laughs> this time, no bad. And so we're going out, and the water had kind of a brownish look to it, but it was flat, calm. It was so serene and peaceful and, and just absolutely beautiful. Going out past the tip of the South Jetty, we go across the Jetty Rib, and it was even very wild at the time, and, and the ocean's flat, calm. And, and about 20 feet in front of the boat, big blue well, mm -hmm. right there. And it was just the most amazing, beautiful sight that I'd ever seen in my life. You know, just this gigantic monster of the deep. And right then, you know, you know where all the ancient sea stories came from, the big monsters. You sit out there and you're, thinking, you're all by yourself, not quite. <laughs> It was a great fishing day. We came in. Yeah. Probably weren't real popular with everybody else, but <laughs> it was it was just a wonderful time. We had a lot of fun out there. You know, fishing as much as we caught fish, and we caught a lot of fish. And at, in the beginning, as my son will attest to it, um, I was not always so serene and nice. And, and I was pretty competitive, and, and we thought it was really important to catch fish. At least I did. And it was very competitive business. And uh, we liked doing what we did. But it's, it's transformed, you know, and the charter industry <laughs> is a people industry, and it's an entertainment industry. It's not just about fishing. And those of us that haven't learned that lesson are no longer here, you know. And so when people get on the boat now, as opposed to in the 60s when they were just piling on to, you know, it takes take two as many, one day we had like four trips we took, you know. And it just, uh, it was just almost like you didn't have to advertise to do anything. The, the boats would be lined up. I, we lived in the old DuPay uh, uh, department store, in walk up there, up in the apartments above. And, you know, the traffic was nonstop coming into the town and then walk up forever. It just never quit. And there'd be miles of lines of boats coming into the port. And it was, you just took people out. You know, it was just kind of this, and now, you know, the people aren't always there in great quantities. And so we learned that it's really about entertainment and showing people a great time on the boat and having fun with them and, and doing that. So I think the biggest transition in our industry has been from that initial, we gotta get people out the boat, you know, and, and you gotta get them fish, you gotta get back, and you gotta more fish. I, 
I've been in the industry for, you know, this is 62 years I've been doing this. And, uh, you know, maybe in, in two hands, maybe three, you know, I could count the complaints to the vote. And I always remember those just like they happened yesterday. And 90% of the time it's because the fishing was too good. You know, this trip was too short. You know, they came out there and said, oh, you did be good. I don't even have any scales on my fingers. What happened? You know, we're sitting there with all of our fish and they're packing them off the boat and we had like a half hour trip out there and back in, you know. And people paid good money to go out fishing and, and they felt like they were robbed or cheated or something. And so now it's, it's we have to throw back everything because you can't get, you know, get to keep uh, what do they call those natives? Uh, we have to throw the native salmon back, you know. So, but we're out there all day, and people are having a great time. And they catch a lot of fish, and, and so uh, it's an entertainment business. And as long as we keep that in mind, and people are out there having a good time, enjoy the day, and, and have their lunches, and, and have a few beers or whatever, you know, it, it makes a big difference. And, and I think that's. The biggest lesson in our industry anymore is that it isn't always about the fish, you know. It's the, it's about being able to catch them, um, but uh, not always about catching. Bring it in. We have lots of fun. <laughs> See, that's that's the part my wife never got in on. She's always in the office doing the treasury and the booking and all that stuff. We're out there having a good time. One of my favorite things, I had an uh, autopilot on the boat, on the old Four Seasons, but my wheel, the nut on it would come loose, and every once in a while it would come off. <laughs> yeah, I just, come off. So I'm talking to my cousin, I'm sitting here, crossing the bar, got the autopilot on, I'm not saying anything, and I just, uh, da, da. and so I turned to the customer to talk to him, and I, I have the wheel in my hand. <laughs> and, and Rick Duell was my dick, and at that time said, Rick, watch, get what? I said, quick, take the wheel up on the bridge. And he goes flying up towards the bridge. I said, Rick, stop. He says, what? You forgot the wheel. <laughs> Customers are going, One bad thing about having your wife at the office doing the booking is that she screams everybody that comes on the boat. So all the other boats have these good looking gals get on their boats, you know. I, I got these old guys, you know. One day it must have been, I don't know what happened, but I must have been the only boat open or something, but I had four really nice looking gals come on board the boat. And I wasn't all that old then. <laughs> and not that I would ever look astray, believe me, but it's still it's just kind of nice to be, you know, see the attention for them. And so I had them up on the fly bridge of the boat. And we're going up north, we're pounding on the way up north, and it's it's not a bad, it's not, it's not this. It's probably a third of that. You know. And we're we're splashing and pounding. And I could tell by their eyes that they're getting a little nervous. <laughs> they, they're not sure what's going on. And, and so I kind of play around a little bit with them. So I'm, I'm doing this. You know, my eyes are getting a little big now. And just, and I go, and he said, they look at me and said, is this really rough skin? I said, I don't know, this is my first trip. <laughs> and, and so we, we go a little further. And I, I just pound him. Rick! He says, Watch him! Come up here! I whisper into his ear. He goes back down below. We're going like this. 
He brings up two life jackets. <laughs> one for me, one for him. <laughs> We had a family on board from Nebraska. Only four of them. Man and wife and two little kids. Fishing. South. Beautiful day, flat ocean. With a blue shark. And uh, we get close to the boat. We never bring those things on the boat. You just cut them off. But the, the devil on one side of me says, let's bring it in. <laughs> and we, we flip that thing, we put it on the deck, and Rick and I both jumped up on the, on the rails, screaming. You know, <laughs> these people, the wife of the brass, and they're going, <laughs> <laughs> Then I'm going to come to the question. Anybody who's been fishing always knows about the, the joke where you grab a line and you bounce the rod and, and get somebody excited about catching a fish or something and you always know, catch them off guard. They get excited for about two seconds and then they turn around at you and go. <laughs> We had a limited hour, we are just boat fishing, and this gal on the boat, nice gal, love that lady, she was great. She didn't like me, I don't know why, so, I mean, she liked me to tell, you know, the story. <laughs> so we, we do the grab the line thing, we did, and we're just, and she was sleeping up there in the you know, bow and just kind of relaxing. You got to fish that. She grabs the rod, you know, and she's, oh, and she's like this. By that time, I'm around the side of the boat, too. And so we walk her all the way around the boat. It's just, and she's just, and I said, I don't know what to do now. So let's make it obvious. So we go down the side of the boat again. This time, I take the, the diver and the bait. We stick it between the rails. I'm walking all the way across the boat to the other side and stick that between the rails. She, here she comes. <laughs> like this, through the rails. <laughs> through the rails. And I'm thinking, it's gone too far. She's going to kill us. I don't know what to do. And so this time, third time around the boat, I put the diver and the bait in the head. <laughs> and she's really <laughs> I ran up on the fly bridge, I gave Rick the gaff hook, I said, keep her down there! <laughs> There was a person standing on that boat. <laughs> it was not a pretty sight. Oh. Did you have to get her mind back? <laughs> I didn't want to get that close to her. <laughs> I stayed on the bridge all the way out. Okay. So, bye, everybody. <laughs> oh. Things turned around in the 70s, uh, late 70s, is when our season started getting shorter. And, and they had the, I don't know if any of you heard of the Judge Bolt decision or not, some of the of heads, yes. Uh, basically, it was a decision stating that Native Americans, we had a fish in common with 50% you know, fish in common. And, and fish in common, it means if you only get a charter boat, I would come out and fish with it. You know, it it was a different interpretation. So the fisheries had to change their management. And what happened is that 
they had to protect 50% of all the fish on every stream of the lake. And so it didn't make any difference how many fish we had at the mouth of the Columbia River. It all had to be taken care of according to what might be able to tweet or holder. And if they had a weak run up there, then they would manage the whole fishery to protect that one run of fish. And ever since then, our industry has gone, you know, from the salmon point of view, downhill. So from the mid-70s on, probably about 78, I think is when that happened, now we have the flood of people, because they closed us down, it was never been closed before. And all of a sudden, the fisheries department said, oh, we're shutting you down mid-August. And of course, August is not our best time of the year, that's our busiest month. And so the, the other bad part about my wife's job is that she had to face all those people and make all the calls, and they're on their vacations, and they're coming in from every parts of the world to go fishing at the mouth of the Columbia River, the fishing capital of the world, and we're shut down. And uh, we find, we've been under those restrictions now forever. That's why when people phone up even now, we tell them they want to book August, and they said, no, what do you want to book? And they said, oh, how about the 28th or 30th or 20th or whatever? And we tell them, we'll put you down, but we can't guarantee you we can take you out. And that's kind of what the business is now. So it's gone from, you know, thousands of people lining the streets and coming to El Waco and all these huge back miles and, and the tourist business and stuff. It's come to, we just don't know. That's kind of where it is right now. We just don't know. Even this year, it was. Uh, we got closed on the 22nd of August, and, and we just put those, those. I just put my first paycheck in the in the bank that I got to keep, you know. And I'm thinking, oh good, I need about three more weeks. We'll have it. We'll have it made. <laughs> Which is a different story, but every year my wife and I have always looked at each other about this time of year and say, if we can only get through this year, we'll have it made. <laughs> and that's kind of where our business has been over the last umpteen years. Um, I don't want to bore you too much. Uh, if you have any questions, anything you would like to ask about the industry or stories, whatever you want to ask, feel free to at this time. I'm open to your. Do you remember roughly what your father's first boat cost him? Um, Compared to what your boat yeah. that you just ordered, you don't have to give me the exact details. No, but uh, the Four Seasons, which was a 42-foot Ross, it was a fiberglass boat. And that was the one that I ran for those early years, a lot of the time. Um, he bought that boat for $20,000 in 1969. Um, and was it fairly new then? Yes, it was right out of the shop of the Westport shipyards. And, uh, and, and so it was about 20000 To put things in perspective, I just spent $150,000 putting an engine in the Four Seasons. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, it gets exciting. <laughs> yes? Yeah, fish story. Uh, you talk about the days that you uh, caught the uh, blue tuna. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I'm kind of a, a newbie to the tuna industry. You know, I, there's our neighbors next door, the Civic Sandwich Charters, they've been running tuna trips a lot longer than I have. But so, like all fishing, it's good to be lucky. You know, and uh, we were a beautiful day out there. And, uh, the guy that I just talked about putting an engine in my boat, the mechanic that put the engine in the boat for me, Caleb Lekowski, he's the one that caught the fish. I was taking him out as a favor for all the work he did in the boat. And uh, we, uh, I, I took a look at the bait. It was uh, caught in a plug, a cedar plug. And it was just bouncing right off the stern real close. And I usually fish that plug way out. I was about ready to make a comment like, who put this bait here? And about that time it took off, it was like this. And 
And Caleb grabbed the rod and it's spooled it like three times. You know, it just, it, we, this is a 60 pound test, pretty heavy, big spool. And we kept looking at the water and I thought, how am I going to get that in a net? You know, it was just this, and it turned out it was a 63 pound uh, bluefin. Uh, back in, 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 uh, in Japan, it was, it was very, for uh, sushi, it's it very, you know, they sell for a thousand dollars a pound. <laughs> and here's a 63 pound bluefin. Uh, the same record kind of sport fish uh, bluefin before that was like 30 pounds, 31, 32. So it was huge. Yeah. But pretty exciting. You know, I mean, that was. Did you sell the fish or not? No, no. It, Caleb got it. It was his fish. I would uh, keep it. Yeah. But uh, no, we, you can't sell sport caught fish. So. We don't even go there. Uh, it's, uh, but it does lead me to a story <laughs> because I, th I think, I, th I can't, there's no verification of this, of course, but I think I'm the only person in captivity <laughs> who ever caught a salmon out in the ocean with his bare hands. <laughs> true story. Yeah. Everything I said at the today has been all true. <laughs> I was fished with a buddy of mine, uh, Mike Maurice, and he also graduated from Wilson High School. I know that it had some people from Wilson High School. And his dad, he was a heart surgeon. He's a very wealthy and to do family. Uh, but uh, we were fishing on his boat, the El Diablo. And it had a big old pl boarding platform on it, and, and there wasn't much fishing room on it. It was a yacht, and I was fishing up the window, and I caught my gear in the wheel, and so I, I decided to get the gear. So I, I'm down there, and I'm on the board, boarding platform. I've got my armpits into the water, trying to get my gear up. Right there, right there. Look at nice snook salmon. And I thought, we hadn't seen a salmon the whole day. <laughs> you know, and anybody knows about the Chinook salmon, you can grab them right in front of the tail, and the little bob in there is almost like a handle. And uh, if you squeeze tight enough, and they don't see down. And so I'm coming up from underneath the water, and I got it just right in front of the tail, and I grabbed on the Stuck with the most the old fish we got that entire day. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think anybody else has ever done that. <laughs> At least they haven't come forward and said so. so. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In your story where you said you were running for three hours. Before, yes. Do you, did you run out of, did you ever run out of gas or were you worried? Uh, I was worried only because I didn't know where I was. And you know, you, you sit there and you run that long, and that's a long time to be running. And the boat wasn't very fast. You know, the, the four seas at that time had a six cylinder Detroit diesel that, that I think I ran about eight knots, it wasn't fast. So I probably only got about 24 miles at eight knots. But even so, I had no clue what side of the river I was on. And once you get to the beach, you have to make it flip a coin. <laughs> you know, you know, See, do you think you'd be south of the river or north? I'm not sure. I guess south, <laughs> which was good. You know, and we had ways of navigating. What we did in those days, when we had no clue of the electronics or how to find the mouth of the river. You always had to be aware of the river was. You know, you always had a pretty good idea if you're north or south. And what you would do is you'd run a, a course that takes us directly to the beach. You know. And you would wait until you got about 50 feet of water. And then if you were south, you would head parallel to the beach, follow your compass course, until you found the sunken jetty of the south jetty. And if you watched your flasher that we had, it would come up to about, you know, 20 feet. And if you're 50 feet of water, all of a sudden it's showing 20 feet, and then as it drops back down to deeper water, now you know you're at the tip of the South Jetty. Then you can swing your course in across 
uh, to where a jetty should be. And you, I give all your flasher, and once it dropped down to 60 feet, you do it, you're in the channel, and then, then you can find the channel from there. And that's how we, we did that for so many years. Plus, you give them a fly bridge, you listen to the buoys, because all the buoys have different sounds. And so you can pick up which buoy you're by by listening. So that's how we used to navigate. There's very few of us left that could do that, incidentally, <laughs> because everybody else has been growing up with all the fancy electronics. If the electronics left them, they'd probably be calling for help. But, but to answer your question, you don't really leave the dock unless you can run all day and get back, you know, by running open all day long. You don't leave with without enough fuel to do that. Uh, yeah, the tanks hold 500 gallons. So <coughs> even, even at a Detroit diesel's rate, that's a lot of fuel. No, we, we never let it get down too low. Yeah. But thank you for that. <laughs> I forgot to answer that part of the question. <laughs> so, do you, how, how do you function as a family business? Or do each of you function individually? At what point do you branch out? And do you have all of your boats on the water all the time, or they're seasonal? Well, first of all, the charter industry is seasonal. So we only fish from, from now that we open our business the 1st of May and usually close it about mid-September. Um, in answer to the family part of it, um, my grandson Joshua, who is in that Family picture here. He's, I'm not he's, sure everyone saw that picture. Yeah, um, I'll pass it out over time. But this is four generations here, and at that time we all could run boats. Although my dad had quit running a boat at that time, he wasn't running a boat then. But uh, all four people of this picture have run charter boats. My grandson Joshua, who's my oldest grandson, he runs the Four Seasons, which is the boat that I ran for since 1977. So he started, matter of fact, he got his license last year. Was it last year? Two years ago. Two years ago. Time flies when you have fun. Uh, two years ago, he had his license, and uh, it was August, and I thought, you know, I ought to let him take the boat out. You know, just get his feet wet, or else he's going to lose interest in that license, you know, if he doesn't get to use it. And uh, so I stayed at the dock. Tough day for me, staying at the dock. And uh, because then I had to sit next to the wife and listen to all the other parts of the industry I didn't care much for. And uh, so he's out fishing. And, and so the next morning, you know, we all get back. He gets back in, did well, you know, and got back in, had a good day, and blah, blah, blah. And so I show up in the morning and says, what you doing here, Grandpa? I said, huh? <laughs> this is my boat! <laughs> huh? <laughs> I was replaced <laughs> oh, at the dock. I couldn't stand it, so I got another boat. <laughs> I have a brother in Denver, and he loves to search and fish. But he needs to plan a trip. How the hell does he do that anymore? You don't. It, you know, last year, about three days advance notice, they gave us a six-day sturgeon fishing season, starting that weekend on, what was it, Sunday? Oh, Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Monday, Wednesday, Saturday. Yeah, sorry, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday for two weeks. Six days. And we had three days notice. We, we had boats sitting in the first day because we couldn't get people informed in time, you know. And uh, then they shut it down the sixth day. Yeah. You know, and they, they, they squeezed the window. It used to be, used to be, you know, a 40 or 38 inch window to 60 inches on a sturgeon. And then, then it was uh, 42 to, to 50. And then last year it was what, a six inch window? 46 to 50. Yeah, I think we had like a six inch window of a keeper. You know, and, and here we're catching all these big fish that were keepers at one time, 
throwing them back, throwing them back. And we still got closed early. We, only, we got closed after five days. Come so, it's the, ridiculous. It, it's so politicized, the fisheries, is that there's very little management. As a matter of fact, um, I was, I coached golf at the school, high school, when I was teaching there. And I ran into the head of the fisheries department at the golf course up in, in Sahali. Or not Sahali, uh, Surf. Surfside. Not too far away. <laughs> and uh, I asked him, because this was, you know, this is probably about 10 years ago when I saw him up there. But, um, I asked him, I said, you've, you've closed our business down. We used to have 150 charter books in 1970 out of here. We had 13 out of our own office. And uh, we're sending out over 100 people a day, you know, just constantly. And I said, and we had a three fish limit. And not only that, but there were 4,000 kicker boats out there every day, you know, just catching fish like crazy. I said, that was the mid 70s. That's when you took over, <laughs> late 70s. I said, we're now down to, at that time, I think it was about 22 charter boats left and a two fish limit. And just a fraction of the sport boats that used to come out. And I said, so we're down over 90% of the effort that we used to put out. And I asked him, what do you have to show for it? You know, if we're the problem, and you cut our industry over 90% of what it used to be, what do you have to show for it? Should there be a lot more fish? That was my question. So, and he says, you never were the problem. I said, if we were never the problem, our industry isn't dependent on catching fish, it's just taking people out fishing for that opportunity to catch fish. So why would you do that? His answer was, we're the only ones we can control. <laughs> I said, so that means if, if I have a, a gangrene in my right leg, and you cut off my left arm, you can do that because you can? Is that it? You know, because the gangrene's still here, you know, but you cut my left arm off. How does that help? But that's what he told me. And that's why, you know, we're kind of, that type of management is probably why we're in the trouble we are now with our fishes. It's, uh, it's not managed by the people that know the industry. You know, anytime you get an appointee to a position that doesn't know the industry or doesn't know where El Waco is or, or where Westport is or anything, they probably don't care too much. You know, I think that's the political end of, of the dilemmas we're in with our fishing industry. People just don't care. <laughs> that, that control the buttons. It's not fair, it's not right, but it's kind of the way it is. Uh, I want to ask you a question about the hatchery fish. Yes. Do, do they release those fish after the season's over so that you don't accidentally catch them as they're going out to sea? Well, you wouldn't catch them because they're like this. Oh, they're, okay. they're small. They're that small um, when they send them out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are very big. Um, and here we have bird issues with the hatcheries, you know, the cormorants and the terns and stuff, they, they feast on these guys like crazy, you know. And so it would make more sense to me to, to barge the small down and just drop them in the ocean, you know, than it would be to, to let them fight all the elements coming down. And we like to blame sea lions and everything else, and sea lions are an issue, you know especially to the sturgeon because if you have, you know, in the 70s and 60s and 50s, the sea lion was, you saw one, it was kind of an event, you know. And, and the commercials, actually, they had, uh, um, yeah, paid for the sea lion nose, you know, kind of off, you know, they, they had a bounty on them. And then, now, 
you know, you can count a thousand on the south jetty going out. And they're all the way up the rivers. And, and, you know, and they're everywhere. Well, if you have that massive amount of the body of fit, our predators that like salmon and other fish, when the salmon aren't running in the river, what do you need? Sturgeon. And people say, oh, see, that doesn't eat sturgeon. And I say to them, oh, yes, they do. <laughs> I've seen them just swallow them whole. You know, they'll, they'll sit there and grab one and then flip it up in the air, grab the head first, and then swallow it down. Just like this. No more sturgeon. No, they eat anything that's out there, the predators, and, and eventually they're going to go after man because they don't fear us at all. My, my grandson, uh, Eli, just about lost an arm to one because he went to net of fish, you know, out in the ocean. This big guy came out from underneath the boat and grabbed that for that fish and stuff. He came just that close to his arm. So they'll, they'll pull up. They'll go after humans. They have. There's stories already out there. They were they have. So they're an issue, a problem. And it's really hurt the sturgeon industry more than the salmon, I think. But that's where that part of it. Great questions. Anything else? Yes. Do, do you have any particular customer that you think about and was very interesting to you? You must have. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, in our industry, we've had movie stars, you know, and, and all kinds of people come in. But uh, the, uh, we had Dizzy Dean, you know, who was, anybody knows baseball, who was Dizzy Dean, who he was, you know. And uh, some other people that came out, it was, some, it was big. I had uh, the, not KGW, you know, it would be. There was a market boy or something. She just retired. The, uh, Channel 2, K-A-T-U. Yeah. I had her on the boat. And one of my favorite... <laughs> might as well end with that story here. One of my favorite things to do, being a young... I, I wasn't always this old, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would always ask... I would have to pick some young lady who wasn't real big or heavy because I'd always ask them, I said, you want to go where the big ones are? And they always say yes, you know, because everybody wants to catch a big fish. I said, okay, so I'd pick them up and I'd hold them over the rail. And I'd say, are you sure you want to do this? You know, and, and then usually, you know, laugh and yell at you a little bit or something, you bring back in and sit down and everything's fine. I did that with this Barbie. She didn't like it. <laughs> we're we're fishing. I mean, we're off the spit and a peacock spit. Not a bad swell, but but I picked her up and she started kicking and doing this and that. I go, please hold still. <laughs> and we hit the bottom away and go, oh. <laughs> I finally got her back on board. I said, okay, that's probably shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the person else. Actually, I think the last time I did that, I, I, uh, I picked up a young lady and, and her husband was right next to me, you know, right next to her fishing. And same routine. I mean, the people like, yeah, yeah. But up there, and she went completely limp. Like, Nothing. <laughs> no response, no nothing. And I go, I'm thinking, I killed her. I said, <laughs> I, said I could be behind jar of bars for the rest of my life by four kids that will eat, you know. And uh, I bring her back on board, she's still completely limp. And, and her husband, almost zero reaction, says, she faints all the time. Don't worry about <laughs> I did that a lot of years, and then I, I quit doing it after that. <laughs> no more. I'm getting too old and tired. <laughs> it seems that you're ending on kind of a, a downer. But oh. yet you, you keep at it. So there must be some sense of 
joy or hope, and, and you're, you're going to go out and do it again, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and my wife is the only roadblock there. You know, she's been walking to fit for, she says, oh, 62 years is enough. And I said, really? <laughs> so Mary, do you 52 years? What do you mean? 62 years. So if not you, then your son is going to continue. What, oh. what is it that keeps you going out there when it's... You know, um, for me it was just a passion. You know, there's certain things in life that you're passionate about. And fishing is my passion. And I love the challenge of, of like the albacore fishing now. I just really love it because I haven't figured it out yet. And so there's more to learn, there's more to do. And and I love experimenting. I, the name of my boat at one point was going to be the innovator. Because I've always got into fisheries, different fisheries, and changed them. And it was from my baiting style as a young boy to sturgeon fishing, which I was very bad at to begin with. I, I was terrible at sturgeon fishing, couldn't figure it out. And I thought there was something, you, know, you had to have a certain scent on the bait or something. And so I was always experimenting. Because that's what fishing is, it's trial and error. And putting and making correlations and putting them together. And I, uh, so, when I first started sturgeon fishing, everybody says, you gotta use, uh, what's that line called? Dac drop. Dac drop line or something. That it's like a braided line, and, and you don't want to you put a bait on backwards, you put the hook in the head, and swim it backwards, and all this stuff, and you don't want it moving around too much or anything. I thought, really? And my crazy head, every time I think fishing, I think movement is what attracts fish. You know, smell and movement and the activity in the water. And so I decided, I, I, because when you, the last one that started a fishery, and I was the last one of the charters to do sturgeon. And I said, when you're starting there, you hate to come out with something brand new because people, you're already not very good, then you do something really bizarre and they're really laughing at you. But, but I always told the kids at school, when I was teaching, I said, you know, don't be afraid to, to push the limits a little bit, you know, just, just try, if you do the same thing that everybody does, else does all the time, all you're going to be is the same. You're not going to get any better. You're not going to stand out. You're not going to challenge it. And all you're going to do is just go through life, don't create waves, you know, just, and so I said, you got to push the limits a little bit. You know, just don't be stupid. You know, don't test your body with drugs and say, oh, whether the drug will kill me or not. You know, but, but certainly press the limits and try, don't be afraid to fail. I think that's the key message in anything. Don't be afraid to fail. And so I wasn't. I, I came up and I did everything that you said you couldn't do. I used monofilament line as a leader. I uh, ended up baiting it just like you did for salmon. I got that bait just spinning in the water like crazy. I went out and on one weekend with one rod against the 10 customers, I caught half the fish in the boat or hooked half of them with that setup. And so I went out the next day, did the same thing. I said, all right, I'm gonna go to all monofilament leaders and just bait salmon leaders like I did for salmon. And our sturgeon fishery turned around overnight. I went from mediocre to the top of the fleet, just like that. <laughs> so, don't be afraid to experiment. I love fishing for that reason. Went down and did the same thing with halibut. Got a new port, but I went there. And it's just fun to go in and, and see what the norms are, and then try to go beyond and see what you can do different to make it work better. That's the passion I have. Well, let's just celebrate that passion and thank you for being here.